How's it going guys and thanks again for being here. Today I'm reviewing the WeLight Ninja 400 which is made by a company that most people know is called Ville Trucks and this is a bicolor light so stay tuned, don't go anywhere, I'll be right back. And the usual disclaimer, they sent me this light for me to test it out, I don't get paid to say anything here, this video is not sponsored by them, and all my words and opinions, they are my own. I want to tell you in advance everything that I want to show you here, I'm going to show of course the actual V-mount batteries, what you get with the brightness and its limitations when you actually install the V-mount battery here, and also the most important thing, show you guys the light with an actual subject, instead of just shining the light on the wall, which doesn't do anything, right? They usually sell the light the way it is, of course, with the included reflector, but also they sent me a soft box that is supposed to be a separate purchase, but I believe there are kits that they sell with the slides that actually come with the soft box. And they also include this beautiful case. Every time I have a light here that does not come with the case, they actually mess with my bedside because finding a case for a particular light not only costs more money, but it's actually difficult to find the right dimensions and all, but it does come with the case, so that's one thing out of the way. This entire case is very well enforced and padded. As you can hear, it's a very nice and sturdy actually very comfortable to carry and inside the case as you can see there's plenty of dividers nothing touches anything and also the lid is actually very nice and padded and at the bottom of the case it comes with nice feet as you can see and here's inside the case and what you expect to find inside you have the light itself the reflector also the remote control that's included the ballast a super clamp to mount on the stand the power supply with an xlr cable and over here is a dc power cord and also the cable that attaches to the ballast, which is a fairly long cable. When this light came shipped, when I opened the case, the cables they were all over the place. And the best way to place these cables back here is to use this cushion here, put the cable this way, and also the power cord, so nothing touches the light. And on top you have the shoulder strap, which I never use. And over here comes with a little accessory to mount the power supply on the stand. It's not my favorite thing, but it's here. I don't have the Mark 1 to compare, but what I can see, the main difference is between the Mark 1 and the Mark 2 is the actual ballast, the way they made this particular ballast. Also, it is mountable, and they included this mount in case you want to mount on a stand or anything with a, with a shape of a pipe. And also, they also improved the release button from the Bowens. It's a large button, which is actually very nice and easy to release the uh, soft boxes and everything else. And of course, on the other side of the ballast includes a V-mount plate, which makes this light portable to take it on the field. But keep in mind that when you install a V-mount battery, you are limited to 50 55% light brightness and as a warning do not use 26 volt V-mount batteries because you're going to fry the circuits of this ballast only 14.8 volt V-mount batteries and lower. So here's the thing with the limitation with the V-mount battery even though the manual says you can go up to 80% or something like that it's actually not true because I tried all kinds of V-mount batteries here and all the people who reviewed this light before me they also say the same thing you cannot pass 55% this is actually the limitation that you're gonna have with the V-mount battery. So everything is off I'm going to install the V-mount battery right now. Now power the ballast. Then your limitation will be 55%, no matter what you do. Now to run AC, power off the ballast again. You don't have to remove your V-mount battery. Just plug this thing in here. You're gonna hear a click. There you go, I don't know if you hear, but which means detecting current right here. Power on the ballast. Now you actually have 100%. One thing that I always recommend, lower it down to 0% or 1%. So every time you start the ballast, either with the AC or the actual V-mount, you don't blast this light cold to 100% because also it's not good for the LED. Always start slow like this here, like 1%, 10%. If you guys are looking for a V-mount battery, one of my favorite brands is the Skarstar brand, which is a 14.8 V-mount battery, and also because it is actually very affordable. And this battery is actually 201 watt hours. So if you don't know what watt hour means, let's say, for example, let's pretend this light is 200 watts, and this battery is actually 200 watt hours, right? If you actually crank this up to 100%, you're going to be able to run this light for a full hour before the battery dies. And the same thing if you actually reduce the intensity to 50%, you're going to be able to run this light for two hours and at 25%, four hours. And a simple math here, this battery is actually 201 watt hour divided by the 150 watt lights that this light has equals 1.34, which is about an hour and 18 minutes or so. And this is actually at 100%, of course. If you actually drop it to 50%, 201 divided by 
75, you can actually run this light for 2.68 hours. What I do recommend that you do, check your gauge, don't wait until this thing starts flashing because it's never good for the battery itself to actually kill the very last bit of juice of this battery. So when you see one bar without blinking, remove the battery and replace the battery. The brightness can go from 0% to 1% increments all the way to 100%. You can also turn off the light from the application, turn it back on. And at the bottom, we actually have presets, 3,000, 4,000, 5,200, 5,500, 6,000, 7,000. Then we have your Kelvin degrees, which is customizable. To change that value, press the custom right beside the thing, and then you set the desired Kelvin temperature that you want to begin, hit OK. Going back to 5,500 degrees Kelvin, when you press the K, it's going to go back to 4,500. In this case, I want to customize it to 5,600 degrees Kelvin, hit OK. And every time we come back here, it's going to be 5,600 degrees Kelvin. And of course, the edge side doesn't do anything because this is not an RGB light. Then we have the scene here, which we have all these effects that I seriously don't plan to use because these effects, they are not really that great. So back to CCT. And on top, you can choose the language Chinese or English. You can also change the channels from here, from channel 1 all the way to channel 19. When we actually ramp up the brightness, it's not stepless, but it is kind of smooth, but not entirely smooth, as you can see. So it's pretty good. You just can't record the scene or whatever it is they're filming, raising or lowering the brightness because you're going to see some little micro steps going on. But overall, it's smooth enough. You want to change the color temperature, the same exact thing happens. Now, when you do this from the ballast, that's when things are more noticeable. The brightness. You see some jumps occasionally. You want to press the button to change the color temperature. So it's not entirely smooth, but no big deal. As far as light accuracy goes, I would recommend all the way up to 8,500 degrees Kelvin, all the way down to 5,600, even a little bit lower around here. Even the 3,200 or 3,000 is okay. What you don't want to do is to go below this 3,000 Kelvin because when it is about 2,500, 26, 28, the colors are a little bit too orange to my taste and it's a little bit of a green cast. The skin tones look just okay, not so great. So I would say around 3,200 is still okay, but the best range of this light is from 5,600 degrees Kelvin all the way to 8,500 Kelvin. The construction of this light mostly made of metal, except the front element and the back element, including the handle. This is made of plastic, but you actually almost swear this is actually made of metal, which means it's a very good quality plastic, but most of it is made of metal. And on the ballast, everything is made of metal, except the top and bottom, which is plastic, but everything here, front to back, and the sides is made of metal. The mounting hardware, it is very difficult to tell if it is made of metal or plastic. I'm going to assume it is made of metal because when I touch the plastic, is actually a little bit warmer than this material. And when I touch the stand here, it's slightly cooler than this material. I'm going to assume this is actually made of metal and this piece of hardware is very robust. It feels very solid once it is installed and once you have the ballast here, nothing wobbles, nothing moves. And also the parts that bite to a stand, they come with rubber so it doesn't scratch your stand either. As you can see, it has a type of a V-mount battery kind of thing going on. So to mount the ballast, go at an angle and you hear that click, mounted. To remove it, make sure you grab this ballast real good, press this button, in an angle, the ballast is out. And on the back of the ballast, you see two RJ45s for your DMX connection and also a USB-C type port for a firmware upgrade. And over here is the cable that you actually connect the light to the ballast. And just one tip of advice, these cables, as you can see, they look nice and neat. To keep it looking this way, when you actually have concrete surfaces or pavement or any rough surface, the moment that you bang this cable on the floor, or if you allow the cable to fall on the floor, you're actually going to be racking this whole finish here, which is actually going to be difficult to insert. So having a cable with smooth surfaces is always recommended, and also making a cable last for a long time. And the same thing goes for this cable with the power supply. I'm at my commercial studio. Sometimes I have to pause here because, as you can hear, the background noise of this place I have to deal with this all day long, so I apologize about the background noise. And one cool thing is, if you're actually interested in a wireless audio, I'm actually recording with the Godox Move Link M2. If you want to see the review of this product, the link is right here. This is actually excellent. As you can see, all the walls, they are bare, and the acoustics here, they are horrible. Check this out.
See how much echo there is here? And I think my audio is pretty good, even though there's no acoustic treatments at all, because this is actually a photography studio. My other studio is designed for video, but this one here, you gotta deal with sound. In which this is actually great, because it shows you guys how my voice is gonna sound like dealing with all this background noise. Sounds pretty clear, and keeping the background uh, noise to the minimum. Because most situations in the real world scenarios, you're going to have to deal with this type of noise here. So this is actually a good test with this particular microphone. Now regarding noise, let's talk about fan noise now. This is a 150 watt light and it's definitely going to have a fan here. This light actually comes with a shortcut. You see the uh, quiet button and to quiet down the fan, which is already quiet in normal mode, you simply press the quiet button and then this flashes, means the fan is actually on a quiet mode. Press it again, it goes back to the full fan mode. To be honest, I wouldn't even bother with this because even if you have in a normal fan mode, it's super quiet already you're not gonna have any problems whatsoever, even in the quietest studios. And the mode set is where you actually change your group channels and everything, and the scene mode is where you access the effects. I don't care about the effects here because they are not realistic, they need a lot of work to be done. I'm gonna be using this light only as a daylight or a tungsten light and that's it. Right now the fan is set to regular mode, I'm using the V-mount only right now, so when you crank this up, you're gonna be limited to 55% brightness. So when you press the quiet button, it's gonna be reduced to 50%, regardless if you actually have the AC plugged in or the V-mount battery. In case of the V-mount battery, when you actually press the button, you're gonna be gaining back your extra 5%, which is the maximum with the V-mount battery. And when you actually have the AC power supply plugged in, you can actually go all the way to 100%. And again, you press the quiet mode button, it's gonna be limited to 50% no matter what you do. So this fan for being super ultra quiet, the only thing that actually concerns me is because the light gets very hot when you actually crank this up to 100%, temperatures exceeding at least 110, maybe 120 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe 125. So I'm not sure if the manufacturer just decided to lower the RPM on a circuit board to make it spin slower and making the light super hot. So that also concerns me about the longevity of the LED because this light does get pretty hot. It should be a little cooler. So what they should have done here you should increase the RPM when you actually have the fan on the regular mode at least twice as fast. And then on the quiet mode, you limit the light to maybe 35, 40, 50 percent, whatever safety levels there may be. But you know, the fan the way it is a full blast, I don't think it is spinning fast enough, which causes the light to go a little bit too hot to my taste. Right now I have the light on for about half an hour, and these are the temperatures they're registering on the heat sink. When it hits the uh, little metal, whatever the thing is, those little pipes there that hold the heat sink, it goes up to 129, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And to me, that's a little bit hot. And for the non-American folks, this is the uh, Celsius degrees, and it's reading about 53 degrees. So in my opinion, this fan should be spinning a little bit faster. The yoke is actually strong enough to hold most modifiers. I have a Godox QRP120, which is a seven pound soft box. It's pretty heavy and four feet in diameter or 120 centimeters. One thing that I can tell you for sure, any modifier soft box wise they want to install, this is not gonna sag or droop because the bite on this thing is very strong. It actually has a rubber disc in between the teeth here. Even though you can actually remove the little rubber washer out of here, you won't need to because the way it is right now, it's gonna hold most modifiers they want. Now, if you're interested in a soft box that is super lightweight, this weighs absolutely nothing, which is kind of cool because all my soft boxes, they are heavy. So if you need something light, I recommend that you actually pick this up just in case you need something easy to transport. This is the VP65 and this is an additional or separate purchase. They actually make some kits that include the soft box. So when you actually buy this light, make sure you're getting a kit. Otherwise, you're gonna have to buy this separately. This soft box is about two feet in diameter. So here's the inside of the soft box. It has the inner diffuser and also the outer diffuser. And usually soft boxes, the actual speed ring is made of metal. But as you can see, this is rather plasticky and including the little tabs here. Now to take this down, there's a little trick that I use for years, especially if you want this to last a long time and not breaking the rods or anything like that. It's very simple. I have a little bench here that can actually put the soft box with, in contact with the surface. The secret is always bend the rods in which you're gonna actually reduce the tension or stress of the rods here. So you bend it slightly and then you do your disassembling here. It's very easy. Once you are halfway, you don't have to bend it anymore. You can easily collapse the soft box right here. Before you assemble the soft box, one thing that you should not do is to apply excessive force, especially on the rods. It doesn't matter if this thing is made of plastic or metal. This applies to every single soft box. So what you wanna do is to press the thumb in 
and pull this out with your four fingers right here. So grab the speed ring in a fashion that's comfortable for you and then this thumb should go in and then this pull out. When you're actually halfway, stop and then come here. What you want to do is to bend the rods that are already assembled. This reduces stress and tension on the soft box. And then you continue here, bend it, again, bend it, and the whole thing is set up here. So these things I find to be a little bit of a pain in the ass to be dangling this way. All you have to do is to find the closest Velcro here, right on the corner right there, and there you go. Now to disassemble the soft box, don't just press on these tabs right here. As you can see, it's very difficult. And again, it can actually break, especially this is actually made of plastic. But this applies to any speed ring, whether it is made of metal or plastic, it doesn't matter. So simply place your thumb right here and the four fingers from behind as close as possible to the stab right here. You don't want pressure or tension right here, right here. Then if you're actually in the field standing up, just place your knee under so you can actually bend it a little bit or you can actually bend it this way as well it is also necessary to reduce the tension right here. So place your thumb right here and have these four fingers to pull it towards you. Put your knee under the soft box to bend it a little bit. And then you finally press this here. Collapse the soft box. Then you put it away, make sure you Velcro so you don't wrinkle your soft box. There's no need to remove any of the diffusers, just slightly punch it in right here, hug the soft box, and then wrap this around. To put it back in a case, don't use the speed ring facing this way. It's going to be very difficult to put it back this way. And then the speed ring is last. It's a little bit of a tight fit, but it fits. And here's the actual little remote. You need to purchase two AAA batteries. Press and hold to power it on. And here's your brightness control to 1% increments very quickly up to 100%. Press the mode button to change the color temperature. Press it again to control the brightness. Press this button to change the group and channel numbers. I find the remote very convenient to use, even better than the app because sometimes I don't want to risk dropping my phone by messing with the lights. So this remote comes in very handy. Right now I have the Ninja 400 Mark II with the actual VP65 soft box in front of the subject. Don't worry about the slides, this is just the LEDs from my strobe. This is actually so weak, it's not even touching or registering anything here. All these lights, they are off. The only light that you see is the VP65 on the subject and nothing else. Right now I have the light set to 10% brightness, the ISO set to 160 f1.8 aperture, and the shutter is 1 80th of a second. As you can see, the picture is gorgeous. The quality of the light is very nice. Now I'm going to go straight to the point and crank this up to 100%. So the light is set to 100%. If you want to lower the ISO, 100 is as low as you can go. You still have to correct here because the face is blowing up. About 2.8, that should look very nice right there. Or you can go back to f1.8 and increase the shutter. Something like that here. Now let's go to ISO 800, which is the native sensor of most cameras. Reset everything here back to 180, F18 and ISO 800. So if you want to adjust your aperture, what will look right at the settings is F56 or maybe F6.3. Yes, this is what looks good right here. Or you can go back to F1.8 and shoot as fast as one one thousandth of a second. This is actually the same exact way that when I was reviewing the Godox UL150 Mark II and it's doing the same exact exposure which tells me this light is equally as bright as the Godox UL150 Mark II which means they're both outputting 150 watts equally. Now the next thing you want to do is to try several color temperatures to see how the camera responds to whatever color temperature that I dial here with this light. So right now let's reduce the color temperature to 3200 degrees Kelvin. And of course, I have the camera set to manual 5600 degrees Kelvin. I just want to see how orange that looks instead of how warm it looks. There's a difference. So let's go all the way to 6800 degrees Kelvin. That's actually displaying right. It's just, you know, cooler as you can see, but you know, the colors, they look good. Now I'm going to stop the camera and set to 3200 degrees Kelvin on camera. 
Right now I have the light set to 3200 degrees Kelvin. It's warm, but as you can see, you need some post-production color correction because she's rather green a little bit. It's not the perfect tungsten that I see here. Like I said, the uh, most useful settings for this light is at least 5600 degrees Kelvin all the way up to 6800 Kelvin, which is not a big deal, but just showing you here that you need some adjustments to do. Another thing to keep in mind here, every time you come here to adjust the color temperature, you have to press this button because I'm actually changing the actual brightness accidentally, so press the button. Now let's go all the way down to 2800 Kelvin, which I know it's not gonna be that great. Actually, you know what? If you wanna do some unusual color grading, which most of you guys do anyway, so it's not gonna be the perfect tungsten color as you can see here, but I actually like the color that I'm seeing here for something like different, if it is a movie that you're shooting or color grading, I actually like this here, but you know, this is not near an actual tungsten light because it needs some color correction here. Right now I have the light set to 1% and I have my meter in my hands, bare bulb, 5600 degrees Kelvin. I have it set to ISO 130 frames per second. First reading is F2 and a half. At 100%, we have a reading of F56. Now I have the reflector on and it's still 100%. Now that's when things are gonna get really serious here. Then I get another 100%. And I get an ISO 100. From 5.6, we're jumping to F16. Now with the light set to 1% with the reflector, we have F56, 1%, ISO 100. Right now I have the light with bare bulb and the brightness right now, it doesn't matter. What we're looking for right now to see if the exposure will change with the color temperature. Right now the light is set to 5600 degrees Kelvin and I wanna see if the exposure will change. First reading at 5600 degrees Kelvin, we have F56.1. At 3200 degrees Kelvin, we should have a slight drop here at four and a half. And at 2800 Kelvin, we have F4.2. And at 6800, we have F56.1. So pretty much, we'll actually change the color temperature from around 5000 or 5600 degrees Kelvin all the way up to 6800 Kelvin. Your exposure is not gonna change, which is a great thing. So if you need to kind of warm it up or cool it down from this half range here, your exposure will remain the same, which is great. Because a lot of lights, as soon as you drop down the temperature, you have some wild swings in exposure here. And this light is pretty much consistent. And that's the end of my review. I hope you find the content of this video helpful. Subscribe to the channel helps me out a lot. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them down in the comment section. I'll respond to everything that I see there. So once again, thanks for being here and I'll see you next time.